praise God. He's moving, isn't he? Can you feel his presence here? Yes. We are going to believe for God to do mighty things in all of our lives, in Brother Tyrone this morning, and then all of our lives. And whatever you need, God is here to take care of it, whatever that need is. And so let's just say a prayer as we're getting into the word. Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit is being poured out. We thank you that your Holy Spirit ministers to each person individually as they need need you. Thank you that you're speaking different things to each one of us. Thank you that you're stirring up faith. Thank you that you're building faith. Um, thank you, God, that you are achieving uh, just through our faith in you mighty things. And that's what we learned about last week, that the mountain would move from here to there when we speak to it in faith the grain of a mustard seed, but the faith is in you. So Jesus, we, we grab a hold of the, the hem of your garment today, Jesus, and we say, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, with whatever we have need of. And we want to thank you, God, that through even uh, these songs of worship and through prayer and now through the word of God, you're building our faith to something powerful. And so, Father, touch your people today. Speak to your people prophetically. Um, touch everyone in this room, we ask, and all of our children in this room and even our younger children in the nursery or nursery workers. Lord, be with them right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray let your spirit be there, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're so glad to have everyone. Um, so, and online as well. I always do a greeting to our online uh, people as well. And I just want to let everybody know, um, if you're a guest, just kind of where the restroom is. If you go through those doors, um, second uh, door on the left will be our restroom. But yeah, feel free to get water or coffee or anything like that. But um, so today we're going to, our message is uh, faith that moves mountains also topples giants. Right? Right? Faith that moves mountains also topples giants. And so we want to keep that in mind. And later we'll do um, our offering and announcements. But I just wanted to go straight into the word because when you can sense that the Holy Spirit is moving, you don't want to break that flow. Um, and you just want to go straight into the word to um, let the Lord keep moving and touching his people. So, yeah, so we're going to be here in a minute. We're going to be in First uh, Samuel 17. But before that, I just wanted to remind us, so as we're learning about faith, we're learning really the vital role that it plays in our lives, right, as followers of Jesus. And we know there's saving faith, right? Saving faith is the faith that when we come and we believe in our hearts uh, and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, right? We believe he went to the cross for us in our place. He rose a third day. That's saving faith. And it's a, that specific kind of entryway or a door into our relationship with Jesus. But then another element of our faith is the faith that we grow in day by day, right? And that's the faith we've been talking about lately is that faith that moves mountains is the day by day faith, right? Where it's growing every day. Jesus is making us stronger every day. Um, and so what we, what we don't want to do, right, like last week, is let unbelief become the holes in our faith bucket, right? Like Pastor Stewie saw. Um, and so unbelief can be lethal to our faith. So what do we do? What do we do if there is unbelief or if something's happening? We're like, I don't know. I believe God can do it, but, you know, I'm struggling with this. Well, we focus on what and who we're putting our faith in, right? When we get our faith focus back on him, then we're in the safety zone. Does that make sense? Right? And so um, we, and the way we do that is we start focusing more on who he is the God of all creation, we start thinking of, of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Um, and we think of that more than even our own ability to believe. So the more you focus on God and you think and you read in his word and you see who he is, then the problems that are facing you can begin to get muted and smaller. And then that faith to move mountains is what is there for you. And you're able to access that. Does that make sense? I kinda, I'm kind of talking through the mechanics of faith. You may be like, well, this is really seems practical, but Sometimes we need something practical, right, to hold on to. And so that's what we want today to know is that even if we're struggling with unbelief, we can cry out for help and say, like the man in Mark 9, I believe you, Lord, help my unbelief. And he won't turn away. He comes in closer. 
So Jesus is the one who came in closer. Everybody else will turn away when we're having issues, but he gets close. Otherwise, he would not come to earth, right? He's incarnational, means he moved in next to you. He moved in with his, got into a fleshly body and moved right in next to humanity, right? He became us in that sense. So the way to shore ourselves up is to lay ourselves down at the feet of Jesus and say, I believe you. I surrender to you. I'm putting my faith in you. And here's a key. I've seen what you've already done, and I put my trust in you to take care of me today and tomorrow. So part of our faith in being able to move mountains is like, I already have a history with you, right? And your history can be years, or it can be like last week. If you, if you started following Jesus last week, you already have a history with him because he saved you, right? So um, that's what it's about is if you took care of me yesterday, you're going to take care of me today and tomorrow. So, but this growing faith, it's essential to our, our success as followers of Jesus, okay? And so we today are going to continue to speak to mountains that are in our way and say, move from here to there. And, and Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So this is what we've been searching out and laying hold of. But today we, ha- we are going to actually have another powerful example of mountain moving faith. We're going to, like I said, be in 1 Samuel 17. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, so Samuel, at this time in Israel's history, Samuel is the prophet in Israel and, and Saul is the king. And Saul is the first ever king of Israel. Um, they really wanted a king, so they got what they wanted. They got Saul. <laughs> Didn't turn out so well, right? But here's the thing. Um, God always wanted to be the king of Israel because he was the, the creator, the father, the everything, not only of Israel, but of humanity, right? And so when Israel insisted on a king and they pushed it for so many years, God finally said, well, I'll give you what you want then. Okay, there's a lesson even in that. God will give us what we want if we push him to it. Does that make sense? Meaning it's better to say that I will be done and let him take you where he wants you, than just to push your will. Okay, so that's another message. But the point is, Israel got what they wanted. They got King Saul, but King Saul continued to disobey God to the point that finally God speaks to Samuel, the prophet, and says, I want you to go quietly and anoint the next king of Israel. And so God sends Samuel to a man named Jesse. He lives in Bethlehem. You know, and Samuel is prayerfully walking among Jesse's sons, and he's meeting them, and he's asking the Lord, okay, which one is going to be the one? And this is what the Lord, you know, speaks to him. He sees the oldest one. He says, oh, that guy's got to be it. He's tall. He's the oldest. He's got to be it, right? But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does. Very key thing I want you all to hear before we get into chapter 17. It says, and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on, it never stopped. That was an unusual thing. In the Old Testament, when the Spirit of the Lord came on people, it was he came on people and then came back off of them generally, unless you were like a prophet, you know. Um, but it was kind of rare even for somebody like a king to have that level of the Spirit of the Lord to rest on them like that. But that we need to hear that the Spirit of the Lord is on David. He's about 15 at this time-ish, um, and from that day on. Okay, so I'm setting it up so you'll know. So let's go to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to read what happens, but just keep in mind that Philistines were one of the constant enemies of Israel. They constantly had to deal with the Philistines, but let's read in 1 Samuel 17 um, what happens. It's a, it's a little, you know, we're going to do the whole passage, so just stay with me. Keep your mind really focused, okay? Lock in to what's going on. Um, it says, the Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Azekah at Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. By the way, since David was quietly anointed, Saul doesn't know any of this. Nobody knows, <laughs> but Samuel and Jesse and them. Okay. But it says, so the Philistines and Israelites face each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. Just think about it. Think on it. He was over nine feet tall. 
He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was so heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. That's scary, right? Nine feet tall. And just his armor weighed 125 pounds. So he's a lethal guy, right? That's, that's scary. And he's the one they're sending out first. And so he continues to taunt them. And it says in verse 12, Now David was a son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrathite from Bethlehem, the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemaiah, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain, these 10 loaves of bread, and carry them quickly to your brothers, and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along, and bring back a report on how they're doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, fighting the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts. As Jesse had directed him, he arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brother. As he, brothers, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. So let's think about this. This has been happening 40 days and nights. So this means that they would run out to meet each other over and over again. We need to start applying what this word is saying to our lives. What in your life do you continually run out? Do you feel like you have to run out to fight over and over? It's an everyday thing, right? That's what's going on. And so it's every day they run out, they get ready, they're looking at each other across this valley, the armies are ready. And then this giant comes out and completely terrifies Israel uh, over and over again. (laughs) So they're getting kind of battered, even just like psychologically, right? Because they haven't gone to battle yet. They've just been taunted by this. So I just want us to keep that in mind. In verse 24, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the men asked? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from, sta- from paying taxes. David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? I want us to hear that question again. Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. Why or what are you doing around here anyway? What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. What have I done now? David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Okay, y'all, you know when you're beginning to ask questions, you want to know what you can do to get better? Some people around you might say, well, what are you doing here anyways? They start taunting, right? So now David, and by the way, he would have been somewhere between 15 and 19 because you had to be 20 to serve in the army in Israel. But he, he probably was, you know, thinking, gosh, I just come out here and I see that big giant. And then now my own brother's, you know, riding my case. I just want to know what's going on, right? But people around us will do that. 
when we start wanting to know more about the situation, the enemy will sometimes send people to be like, why are you, why are you even in this? Why are you even asking questions? Right? So we got to remember, push past that like a Job's comforter. Push past that. And then in verse 32, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. So David's not upset just generally that there's some guy, you know, saying negative things to his fellow Israelites. He is provoked that he has defied the God of Israel. So his upset feeling is righteous anger to say, how dare you? talk to the living God like that. So that's a good provocation to have in our hearts as followers of the Lord um, about um, just the evil things out there, powers and principalities. We should have that provocation to say no. Like, who are you? You know, that's what he's saying. And then in verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Listen to that faith. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come to me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animus, animals, Goliath yelled. Keep in mind, this is a barbaric time when there was warring, right? So this is real ha things that are happening. But David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, <clears throat> but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, this is the highest level of trash talk that could be happening, right? <laughs> this is not this is not whose team is going to win on the court or the field. Or this is whose team is going to win, like and not die. Who is going to keep living? So when they're trash talking, they're not these. They're not just doing. They're doing this for real. Like we're warriors. <laughs> so it, it was big, big time stuff. But anyway, so then, um, let's see. Where was I? Okay, thank you. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, meaning they went all the way into Philistine territory. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all along the road from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the Israelite army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. David took the Philistines' head to Jerusalem, and, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. As Saul watched David go out to fight the Philistine, he asked Abner, the commander of his army, Whose son is this? I really don't know, Abner declared. We'll find out who he is. And as soon as David returned from killing Goliath, Abner brought him to Saul with, Philistine, with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Tell me about your father, young man. And he said, his name is Jesse, and we live in Bethlehem. And there would be a baby boy born in Bethlehem uh, centuries later 
that was out of this lineage from David, and his name is Jesus. Yeah. So that's the warrior blood even that was flowing through our Lord Jesus' veins. Um, but when he came to war, he warred against the powers and principalities, and he came in low and humble and showed a new way to live, right, in the kingdom of God. But he also drove out demons by the finger of God and the power of God and did mighty things. But, y'all, let's look at this. Um, this faith that David had, right, this doesn't just move mountains. This topples giants, right? And so if mountains wasn't as strong for you and thinking metaphorically through moving in faith, maybe a giant will be better for, for what you feel you're facing, right? Um, but this, you know, this kind of faith, it does make things um, that seem impossible possible, right? And obviously, David is not going in his own faith, is he? Like his own faith in himself. He's going in his faith in God, right? And so let's see how he thinks of this. So this kind of faith, it sees the giant in front of you, but only in light of who God is. So if you see a giant in front of you, and I, and again, let's understand the text and be right with the text and context, but it's also think about your life. So when you see a giant in front of you, are you more focused on that? Or are you more focused on the God that's standing behind that giant that fills all the heavens and the earth? The earth is his footstool. So which one, you know, so are we going to, huma our humanity will immediately go to the giant and we'll look at it and be like, whoa. But us as believers of Christ will step back and say, but look at God. Look at God in me. His power, his resurrection power is in me. And so we only look at the giant in the light of who God is. And so when you have that kind of faith, you will say to that giant, who are you? Right? You'll get, you'll get like that gumption. You'll say, who do you think you are? That's scrappy faith, right? David was scrappy. By the way, it was not a slingshot that he used. Okay, just, I just want us to get some context. It was a shepherd's staff. And he put a sling onto that and then put a stone and, like, flung it with all his might. I mean, so this was not, like, a slingshot a little kid uses. This is, like, a projectile. <laughs> this is why, in, unfortunately, in the Palestinian and uh, Jewish conflict, when a Palestinian throws a rock and harms a soldier, they get in trouble. This is the same projectile. So David is using a lethal projectile when he slings that. Okay. So at least he had, so here's the thing. He did his part, right? He knew how to do it. But, but the thing is, we need to have scrappy faith, bold faith. And you know what that is? That's early church faith. That's the church, early church faith that's in us, which it says, like I said last week, when they get in trouble for preaching in the name of Jesus, they're like, you need to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they're like, well, whether we should obey God or man, whatever, you can think we're going to obey God. Yeah. We're going to keep preaching in Jesus' name. We're going to keep doing what he says, even if you throw us in jail or whatever. This is that kind of faith that says we will continue in powerful faith. But so with this kind of faith, your eyes are on the Lord and the Lord alone. Think about that. You're only looking at him. You're not looking at yourself. You're not looking at the problem. You're literally focused on his power and his might. And that is faith focus that's immovable right? That's where we were like, okay, Lord, you're going to help me with this. It doesn't look good. I'm struggling, but you're going to help me. You are going to do it. You are going to move this giant, right? Um, at, at no point in this uh, story does David say, by my power, I will sling this sling, you know, uh, shepherd's staff sling and kill you. It's not. He just said, this is what I'm going to do. That's another thing. That's scrappy faith when you're like, this is, I'm going to lay this out for you, <laughs> what I'm going to do. And then the Lord's going to do the rest. So, y'all, we need to be bold in our faith. That's what Paul meant by he would only boast in the Lord. So Paul was humble about a lot of things in his life. But when it came to the Lord, he was like, he was doing the trash talk, too. He was like, I may look weak, but when I come in person, <laughs> I'm about to tell you what it's like. So he, that he got the boldness and that scrappiness, and that's what we have to have in our faith in the Lord. Um, but he, he needs to become all we see. And we're, we're called to live in that faith focus all the time. Car we're carrying something precious. Remember, in these clay jars that we are, we are carrying this precious 
amazing power, resurrection power of Jesus. So let's not poke holes in it by looking at the issue too long. Right? Because then, then we're like, oh, I am starting to slip. Get our eyes back on Jesus. Here's the thing about difficulties. We get weary, right? When, when something is a long battle, we start to get weary. We're like, how long do I have to go around this mountain? But don't give up. Y'all, join me. I'm saying this to myself. Let's say this to ourselves today. Don't give up. Keep on going. You're going to be blessed. You know, in, in Galatians 6, 9, it says, don't give up. Don't get weary. Because if you'll just keep going, at the right time, God's going to help you. He's going to lift that burden off, right? That was a, that was a Daniel paraphrase. But that Galatians 6, 9 is where you can get the exact thing. Um, but, yeah, let's not give up. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, whose name means salvation and rescue. So faith, this is something I really want us to get in our spirits today. Faith is not something we muster. You know, muster is when you have to build something up. We don't muster faith. We size it up, okay? So this is where there's a big shift here. True faith is when we size something or someone up appropriately against God. And we tr- choose to trust him. So what I mean is, in this case, David, he looked at Goliath, and he's like, okay, I'm sizing you up. You're nine feet tall. You're terrifying. But I have seen the lion and the bear. But, yeah. But you are not the God of all creation. <laughs> so, the, see, David spent so much time worshiping that he was really familiar with God. So if you're like, man, I still feel like my faith isn't where it needs to be. Worship. Spend time worshiping. What is worship? Worship is, it can be praise, praise songs. It involves prayer, involves serving others, and involves just being in God's presence and letting him have every part of your life. The more you worship, the bigger God gets. And that's, and David spent, I mean, he spent time writing songs out in the field. So when he was caring for the sheep, he was also saying, who is man that you're mindful of him? You know, who is the son of man that you would visit him? And he would just sing, and he had his instruments. But y'all, so that's what I mean. Size up what is in front of you compared to God. And then that changes everything. Um, So David asked all the right questions. He observed the unfolding events, and then he assessed the situation accurately. Right? So the right questions, he... I love how he's like, so what is your reward again? He's like making sure he understands what's going to happen because he's so confident that God's about to do it. So he's like, well, I'll have a, I'll get married out of this. I'll get to get married, you know? I'll get to not pay taxes anymore. You know, <laughs> those are good things. Um, but the main thing is that he's asking um, in order to assess everything, but he assesses the situation accurately. And this is the most, one of the most important questions he asked, and I already said it, but out of the New King James Version, it says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God, right? So I think that for you and me, when you see something that keeps haunting you or coming after you, you need to start asking, who, who are you or what is this thing, this issue, that you think you can still keep coming after me? You're nothing in the eyes of God, Amen. that issue, right? Yeah, you're nothing in the eyes, uh, compared to God. Um, but David, he looked at the, Lords of he- the Lord of Heaven's armies and the God of all creation, and then he looked at that giant, and he knew you're nothing compared to God's power, like a mountain that just needed to move out of the way, <laughs> right? So, so he was already doing this mountain-type faith all the way back before we hear that from Jesus. But then... Remember one other thing about David. In 1 Samuel 16, it said the Spirit of the Lord came on him powerfully and was on him from that day on. So this is my message to us today. When the Spirit of God comes upon us, when he lives in us, then that's it. That's it. From that moment on, your destiny belongs to the Lord. He initiates it, and it's game on. And it doesn't matter the highs, and it doesn't matter the lows. You are in his hands, okay? The enemy wants you to, to think you're not quite there yet or you need this more. No. When the Holy Spirit has come upon your life and you've met Jesus, you are in his hands and in his destiny. And even Zechariah the prophet said, not by might, or the Lord said to him, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Meaning 
what uh, Zechariah was tasked to do would happen um, when he rebuilt um, the temple. But listen, the Lord of hosts, that's the same way of saying Lord of heaven's armies. So you have David saying that, and then you, again, you have centuries, a few centuries later than even Zechariah saying it. And y'all, today we need to say it. The Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts, that's the same thing. It's just different translations. When you think of the Lord of heaven's armies, that means that everything that is even in the sky at nighttime, stars, moon, even the daytime sun, all of that's at his command, not to mention all the angels, right? So God, that is who we serve, is the Lord of those hosts. The Lord of those heavenly armies is who we are serving and who is ready to fight for you. That's who fought for David, right? So what's our part? We got to show up to the fight, right? Show up, stand up, get, get a little bit like, okay, I'm here. We need to have that kind of boldness. David didn't go out there like, oh, I hope this works out. No, he was like, let's do this. We need to come with the let's do this spirit because you're not coming in your power. You're coming in the power of Jesus, right? So you need to come in who, you know, come into who you are inside of Jesus. You're wearing his armor of light. You're literally in his armor of light. Come through that to whatever is coming against you. And so when King Saul, he was unsure, right, about the shepherd boy going out to face a giant. But he didn't realize the spirit of the Lord was already on David, Right. He didn't know David's history with the Lord. He didn't know that David had been building this portfolio of faith and communing with God in the wilderness and being, faith, be, being a faithful shepherd. Um, being faithful with those little things and quietly when no one sees, it will show at some point. Okay? Like somebody's going to see you at some point against a giant because you hung out in the wilderness. So don't, don't feel bad about the wilderness or keeping the sheep or doing the thing that's just the mundane. If you do it unto God with faith, it's going to show when it matters, okay? Hope that encourages somebody. But so I love how David answers Saul, and, and he says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. And then he talks about the lion and the bear coming to steal uh, them steal from the flock. So not only did he rescue those animals from their jaws, but then if he actually got attacked, he said, I will, you know, in New King James Version said he grabbed it by the beard and clubbed it to death. <laughs> so again, y'all, we need to get hardcore on those spiritual things that try to come against us and our family, right? Grab that thing by the beard and club it to death in Jesus' name, right? You know, obviously I'm not talking about physical altercation, <laughs> right? Because Jesus, this is all now powers and principalities. Meaning, when something happens, let come out at it. When you see something come against your family, lead your family or lead yourself. If you're, not, if you're not leading a family right now and it's you on your own, lead yourself or lead your family in prayer and say, we're going to pray about this right now. We're going to go to war in prayer right now, Lord. We're coming to you. We're asking you to fight our battle. We're asking you to take that thing down. And that thing, you need to get out anyway in Jesus' name because you don't have any authority. And you begin to pray, uh, pray the word, pray with authority. But I love that he says, yeah, the Lord that rescued me from those lions and bears is going to rescue me from this Philistine. Honestly, when I hear about him taking out lions and bears, I was almost more afraid of them in a way than the Philistine giant. Because at least the giant, you can outrun him probably because he's so big and cumbersome, <laughs> right? But those bears and lions, no. So it's, he's like, no, I've been building up. I've been building up, but, um, but of course we know a spear and a javelin is scary too. <laughs> but um, all that to say, he was building something up, and he knew God would rescue him. So for us, as we're growing in our faith like David, um, our first step of responsibility is taking care of sheep. So for that, that's your daily thing. What are you tasked with daily to take care of, right? So are, are those are our jobs, our families, just our day-to-day, but but if you're doing that with the Lord on your side, you're going to go to the next step. And what's that? Well, you're going to protect, start protecting others. You're going to rescue others. And then you're going to actually be able in the spirit to take out lions and bears that are attacking. And then after that progression, there will be a giant. There will be a Goliath. And then that's when you're going to say, who are you in the presence of my mighty God? That's when you ask that question. Because, uh, Frank, some, some of you, you're already facing giants, right? Right. 
So this is for, for all of us, you know, we have to speak to those giants and say, who are you in the presence of my God? My God is the one who holds my life, my destiny. Every one of my days is written in his book. That's what the Psalms say. <laughs> your, your, your life is written in his book. It's a beautiful thing. So now, that's our progression, right? But here's, here's the thing, too. I want to tell you all something about the enemy using Goliath. So Goliath's first problem was when he thought he was fighting Saul's servants. He said, you know, I'm not, he basically said, who are you? Um, I'm sorry, lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, he, he, the thing is, he was trying to say, Goliath's point of view is, who are you to try to fight me when you're only Saul's servants? That was his first problem. Well, he's not just fighting Saul's servants. He was fighting people that belong to who? The Lord. That's who he's fighting. His second problem was that he was verbally defying the armies of Israel, which meant he was actually defying the Lord himself. Right? And then finally, this, you know, when David said, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, at that point, his third problem was now he had God coming against him. The enemy did. So he should have run. But he didn't. Right? He didn't. And it, because here's the thing. Evil never knows when it's been defeated. You all need to hear that. Evil never knows when it's been defeated. Because even at the cross of Christ, there was a lot of jubilation, a lot of cheering in the, in the evil. But he raised the third day. And then it was over. It was over on the cross. But he put even more power and victory in that raising the third day. But I love that David says, today the Lord will conquer you. And then he says, you know, I'll kill you, cut off your head, etc. And he said, this is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran to meet him. Think about that. So... You know, Goliath is getting positioned, and so normally you would see David or the other person, like, readying themselves for battle. He didn't just ready. He ran. Okay. Let's become, let's become like that again. Let's become like that, like David in the spirit, and say, I run to the battle. I run to this because it's not me. I'm positioned, and I'm the vessel. Um, I'm the canvas. I'm the conduit that you're going to flow through, but it's really you that's either going to pour in the victory, paint the victory picture, or run that victory through me. So when the demonic forces of evil want to come against us as the people of God, we have to boldly declare the word of God and run quickly to prayer to meet that challenge, right? Um, because we're not, we're not just running to it just to be running to it for nothing. We're doing it in the name of the Lord, like David, and we can run with the assurance of victory. Okay, so we don't need to be afraid. God is the one fighting our battle. And what we're bringing to the battle is our faith in him, right? Okay, so I'm going to check this out here. But David did do his part, right? He brought his faith in God. So another thing is sometimes in our faith walks, there's a little bit of, um, what's the word for it? Uh, like lethargy that can set in or, or, you know, where you're just kind of resting on your laurels, sitting back. We, we can't do that. You have to sit back forward, right? And say, okay, I've got to bring my faith. So y- you do have to bring your part. I want to encourage us with that. Bring your part, bring your prayer, bring your faith. You know, because w- if you have been in a battle for a long time and you feel weary, sometimes it is easy to just be like, oh, Lord, can you just do it for me? Because I'm so tired of this, yeah. right? That's normal to say that. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord, again, like David, and step up and be like, no, this is how it's going to be. And you start speaking to yourself the word of God. You start encouraging yourself in the, in the Lord, and then you speak to that problem. And you tell it where to go, right? You tell it where to go. Um, but there's never anyone bigger than our God. So have faith in him, right? There's never anyone bigger. So I have two questions for us today as we're wrapping up. Number one, where is your faith focus? Is it God or is it anything else? So this is a binary choice, (laughs) God or anything else. The anything else can be lots of things, right? It can be ourselves. It can be our own ingenuity, our own innovation. 
but there's th some things in life that kind of push us to the point where it's like we can't do anything about it, yeah. whatever that situation is. So we really need God. Amen. If you're there, you're with the giant, yeah. let God defeat it for you. Okay, so but but where's your faith focus? That's what I'm saying. Where is your faith focus? And then number two, where am I in my faith progression? Meaning, be encouraged today. Whether you're taking care of sheep or you're all the way over the giant, sheep, rescuing sheep, taking out lions and bears, or all the way up to a giant, ask the Lord today to take you to your next growth in Jesus, right? Right? Because, like, for our young people that are starting school tomorrow, that, you know, you're kind of coming to a little bit of battle, right? Because good things are going to happen at school, I pray. But also, it's hard. You know, just you're going to have to put on your armor, the armor of the Lord. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to be ready. Um, you have to look out for each other, look out for, for people you love, um, and pray for them. And so, we, you know, that's a real example of where you are in your faith progression. You can be like, am I suited up and ready for this? Or if you're starting a new job or if you're looking for a new job or whatever the situation is, we, ha we need provision in our body right now and at Evergreen. We need some provision. We need some vehicles and, and, um, and some repairs of vehicles <laughs> and things like that. So I just want us to ask us ourselves, where am I and, and is my faith focus in Jesus? And so we're going to take a moment to pray, uh, pray on that. But also today, um, and this is already on a PDF too, but um, we didn't do a next step for a couple of weeks, but we have a next step for this week. It, it's reset your faith focus and you can read all about it, but um, it's basically taking a one day, just a one day reset fast. You can fast food, you can fast media, whatever, and just say, Lord, where's my focus? Take the time you would have been eating or watching something and just go to prayer and be in the word for a little bit and just silence things out so you can hear the Lord speaking, right? That's what I'm inviting you to. I'm going to do it this week. I would love for anyone to do that with me. Um, but let's take a, you know, a faith reset. And you know why? Because we've been doing this whole thing about faith. This is a good time to reset the focus, isn't it? And to make sure where is it, right? Um, so, and, and something that you all know is we've been working on fasting and prayer throughout the year at different times just to um, get that discipline in our lives. Um, but as we're, as we're going to prayer, let's begin to get our faith and our hearts, our minds focused in on the Lord. Um, and I appreciate Brother Mark for passing those out as well. Um, but yeah, let's just, let's just go, to, go to prayer together and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for your people. We really want to thank you, too, for our guest that's with us today, her family. Lord, bless her abundantly. So, Father, we just pray that you would begin to search our hearts and help us see, is there any other place, God, that we've been putting our hope or our, our faith to help us, our trust? And, Lord, if, if we have put it in something else other than you, we repent of that right now. We ask you to forgive us and to reset us together. And Lord, I'm just, I can just even say in front of our congregation, Lord, I'm sorry for sometimes giving into stress quicker than giving into your spirit. Lord, I pray that Spirit of God, you would be upon everyone in this room in our day to day and even in our large battles that may be coming against us. Lord, let our faith now be focused and refocused on you. Let us think of your greatness, your creator God. You're the God who sees. You're the God who provides. You're our victory banner. You are our, our mighty, mighty warring uh, Lord that went out before us, the Lord of hosts. So, Lord, in every battle that, that anyone in this room is facing, I'm asking that you would fight that battle for them. And I pray, Lord, that we would all run in behind you and go forward in that power. And, Lord Jesus, also, where, where are we, Lord, in, in our faith progression? 
let us go to that next step in you where we're now we've gone from rescuing out of something to now actually being able to take out a lion or a bear lord lord to help us when these things happen in life that are difficult to actually go to that next faith progression so i pray god over your people a holy boldness a, a strength in them lord for whatever they're going through I pray, God, we would swiftly run out to meet the battle in prayer. I pray, God, that we would just echo and reflect this story of faith that will continue to speak to mountains to move, but will also see giants topple in front of us by your power, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray for um, everyone here. I pray for people to find church home, family, and community. I pray, God, for those who do need um, vehicles repaired and new vehicles, Lord, just to open those doors. I pray for provision that we don't even know about that people need. God, we pray for you to open doors. And Lord, most of all, for all of us, I'm asking Jesus that we would be with you on a daily basis and seek your heart. And that you would be our first priority that you be the one we think of when we wake up and the one we're thinking of when we lay our head to sleep. So, Father, we pray for that kind of love for you and in our lives. And, Lord, if there's further healing, I know we've prayed over some healing and miracles today. We also pray for anyone else who needs healing in this room physically. We pray for also mental healing. We pray for emotional healing. We pray for relationships. Lord, we pray that any giants that are represented in difficult relationships, that those would also be dealt with and that there would be new life in relationships. That there would be health in relationships, God. And so, Father, touch your people, minister to their needs, and let them take what we had in this worship time, the Spirit of God, with them throughout the rest of the day. And Lord, as even as I'm, and not just I, but we are continuing to pray and about to close out in prayer, God, if there's anyone, I'm now speaking to you, congregation, if there's anyone online or in person as, we're, as our heads are bowed that would say, I need you to pray over me this week, Pastor, I need you to get some prayer coverage for me, raise your hand and I will be able to keep your name, especially in my prayers this week, besides my... <laughs> constant prayers but if you're saying I need some extra prayer I see these hands God bless your precious people thank you Lord you can put those hands down I've got you in my mind and heart and Lord we just want to pray even for those who raise their hands be with them especially Lord in the name of Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord amen thank you Jesus thank you Lord Thank you, Lord. Bless your people. Lord, even as we're closing out this prayer, bless your people in Jesus' holy name. Thank you for them being all together, all of us being together, worshiping your name this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I, there is something I'd like to do if, if we have time and whoever would want to do that, parent-wise. But if you have a child that's starting school, um, tomorrow I would love for us to pray over our young people I'm um, just prayer of their school year so um, yeah so that that's anyone that wants your children prayed over we just want to pray over them and um, pray for their school year and if you want to come up too you can do that um, but we can we can let the nursery out too and if, if Elijah wants to be prayed over or whatever um, yeah the, the kids and parents that want that yeah 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 so, and while they're doing that, I just want to make a couple of announcements. This week is what we call Sabbath week. Um, no women's Bible study tomorrow. And then Wednesday, we're not meeting. So everybody can have a week to get used to school starting. We need that sometimes, don't we? <laughs> so we have a week of, of break from being together. But we'll come back together next Sunday. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to everybody. I'm trying to think of anything else. And then offering and tithe and offering if you have that. You can take that over there right before our prayer for our students. 
the cube. So, yeah. We just want to cover y'all in some prayer. How are y'all feeling about starting school? You feeling good? You excited? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Roman's ready to start school. <laughs> hey, buddy. Well, okay, so let's, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, from the youngest of our students to the oldest, we ask for a mighty blessing upon them. We pray you would protect them. We want to ask you to protect their schools with angels every day. We pray you protect their teachers, protect their administrators. Father, please keep them from any harm whatsoever, God. Let your mighty touch be over each one of them. Encourage them, God. Encourage them in their learning. Encourage them in their extracurricular activities. Let their friendships be whole and healthy. Let them have everything that they need, Father. Also bless their parents as their parents are getting into a new schedule. Be with them. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Provide for them, God. We now thank you that your angels are all around your people. And your people include our youngest. Your people involve our babies all the way up. So bless them, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Yeah. We love y'all. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next Sunday.